Thank you. Hopefully I'm, I'm not particularly keen with the lectern. I prefer to actually wander around, if you don't mind. If I'm pacing around too much, just shout. Okay. Um, yeah, so actually it's a little bit about the IoT, but it's actually more about the effect of it on your business and the challenge that you may face. Uh, and the opportunities and some examples to help people beginning to adopt the technology to help them with their businesses. Um, and whether I give you an answer or whether it leaves you with some thoughts, that's something we can come on to at the end. Okay, um, just a little bit. I, I'm, I'm going to do a brief introduction about ourselves, um, a little bit about market trends and connected buildings. Um, something's going to skew, okay, but uh, how to position your business and servitization, and we'll have a QA and a at the end. Um, so a little bit about what we do. Um, principally, we provide software that connects anything in a building. And when I say anything, it can be in any type of building. So we can talk to petrol pumps, we can talk to uh, the hotel booking system, we can talk to the HVAC, CCTV, and we have drivers or things that can communicate with that, or any item readily. And if, we do, if it doesn't exist, it can be written very quickly and get you talking. Once you've actually got that data, it becomes normalized, okay, from an IP network, and you can then do things with it. So you can now actually got within it a tool to control, you know, when something happens with CCTV, you can actually then interact it with the security system or your HVAC and so on. And you've got this complete application engineering tool. You can present it graphically. Um, you can get reports uh, and, and obviously log in and connectivity. Then on the other side, it's actually a web server. So it actually will provide data up to any enterprise system. We work with SAP, we work with IBM, we work with people outside like Capita and, uh, and uh, Verisa and many, many others where they got access to the data and start using that to actually provide analytical solutions or um, in the case of someone like Tesco's who were actually here earlier, through a bureau where someone's analyzing what's going on and they're doing benchmarking at all sorts of different stores. This even uh, reaches down into apartment blocks. So if you look at all the apartment blocks along the river in, in the Thames there, they've all, got thing, they've all got Niagara in, which is our software. Tridium is the company. Um, so the audio, visual, and things like that are connected. But it's only half the story because Niagara, which is the framework, is open. Okay? It's got a community that actually develop on it. And it's a little bit like you might see with... Uh, uh, your phones and your apps and things like that. Because it's open, we train people to develop on top of it. So they're coming up with new ideas, ways of doing it, and multiplying everything that we do. So there's an ecosystem out there that's actually providing things from bear traps in North America where they're actually monitoring to see whether there are actually bears in there to actually uh, uh, looking at um, different ways of starting up buildings, integrating with BIM. And, and anywhere across uh, the globe with different ideas. And to help that and foster it, um, we provide blogging sites, information where we've got something like 50,000 conversation, 18,000 members just actually passing data between and sharing amongst each other their best experiences and what they can offer. And we offer a marketplace where customers develop things and trade between themselves. Okay, so this is a twofold thing where we provide this, you can use the stuff right out the box, or you can obviously use some of the things that some of our partners have developed across the, uh, the world, and, and that does mean anything. It could be a chiller sequencing guy in Australia or a lighting company in the US, whatever. And so I interact, so it's a twofold thing. But I'd like to step on from that and talk a little bit about the Internet of Things in buildings, particularly. Um, the picture behind there you see is, for those who've been there, is Dubai. Uh, I'm particularly going to come back to them shortly, but anybody's interested in these guys will probably uh, plow the fields for us if you want to in July I think they're introducing the first uh, people carrying drones if you're that uh, way inclined so they're they're really thinking ahead but they they have an advantage where they don't have a lot of baggage with old buildings or things and infrastructure so they're leading with a lot of ideas um, so the internet of things when you actually look at it um, it's not just these devices talking to one another thing, you know, it could be a misconception, that's what it is. It's not about that. It's about cloud, big data analytics, but it's the whole package. And it's about the connectivity of all those things that actually make the whole thing. So it's the whole thing, not just, you know, those 50 billion devices communicating with one another. That helps, 
you know, so that they can communicate with one another, like a windmill farm or something where one's actually saying, hey, I'm generating more power than you because I'm at this angle and at this speed and so on, so they can pass information between them. But it is about the whole thing. And I think the suppliers to buildings are beginning to change. You know, the traditional parts that we've seen are beginning to actually get some smarter services around it. Demand response is going to become an issue. Connectivity and microgeneration, facility management, which you guys are about. Uh, obviously, asset management, all these things. But it's attracting new players. And what you're actually seeing now is all the IT tech companies are coming to get involved in buildings because 40% of the IoT will be in buildings. And so where we're actually working with people who are actually installing things and putting things in at the building level, we're now actually working with Microsoft, IBM, Cisco, Intel, Oracle. Dell want to be in there because they're maxed out on people and laptops. They now actually want to put our software on pieces of hardware. So you're getting a lot more people engaged. It's still very early. They're all still learning, but they are actively going to get engaged. And the only way to do this for everybody is to collaborate. Everybody's got to collaborate because nobody can do this on their own anymore. IBM need our partners because they have the domain knowledge because quite honestly, a lot of the people around the outside here don't know what happens when they get to the front door. Okay, they know they want to get access to the data and provide it to their customer, but they actually need the other end, which is to actually help people. And there's an ever faster adoption of technology when you actually start looking at a bit of eye shot down the bottom, but when you start looking at the, the speed, you can actually think, see things are beginning to stand up much closer in time to short. You only have to look at the telephone, it took 60 years, smartphone was about seven, and got more coverage. You know, my, my children will never have a landline, neither will people in China and India and, and everywhere else. Um, and so I think, again, I'm just saying, you know, you can't do this on your own at this sort of speed. And I couldn't help looking at it when I was looking at the, the, the plot there, just thinking, what does it remind me of? And it kind of <laughs> helps you uh, consider what's going on. But it's actually getting faster and faster. And we're seeing, uh, we heard building management systems earlier beginning to change. This is an old way of systems used to look not that long ago. Okay, but things are happening in the industry now where what you're actually seeing is intelligence is going to the device. Okay, so if the Internet of Things is really going to happen, then everything's going to get smarter. The chiller's smarter, the boiler's smarter, everything's smarter because, and why shouldn't it? Because the manufacturer knows more about that than anybody else, rather than the guy who's just going to come in and engineer it. But they all then start generating different type protocols, so you might have OnVid for CCTV, MBUS for metering, and, and various things, so you've got to integrate that and get those working. But you can get access to that with a product typically such as our own, but once you've got that, and you've got all that data in and you engineered your solution. You know, gone are the days where you used to have a supervisor. You know, and you can hook in legacy systems with, with proprietary type uh, uh, software now so you can actually, you're no longer limited and you can do it partially as you walk through. But the supervisor will change and has changed. Nobody wants to see a room with a, a PC anymore, sorry. You know, people want mobility. So we're moving from that fixed location of where people want to manage things to they want to do it on the run. You know, everybody's working today. Um, they're all using their phones, their iPads, their laptops, and you, you know, you're expected to continue on with your job, same as when you're managing a building. And you know what? The IoT isn't coming to buildings or M2M. It's already here. You know, it'd be a bit of a shock too, I guess, but we've been putting devices to devices, devices to systems, and so on, all the way down. We're providing, we saw it earlier, we're measuring things, we're actually collecting stuff, we're monitoring, you know, and all those things on the right, they're all connected. You know, you walk into a building and it's hunky-dory. The only problem is that to date, with those older systems, is the data is sat there on a PC with 500 alarms in the basement, and nobody does it, which is why I was actually saying the IoT is then getting that information to people who really know it. It's no longer the electrician or one guy who's on holiday. It's actually able to be provided to people who can, who can do it. Who better to look at your chiller problems than the chiller manufacturer, if that's the case, give him access. Um, but, you know, FM companies are doing that and working with you to provide some of those solutions. And there are equipment manufacturers who are getting onto that now, and that will be another phase. We'll see where the equipment manufacturers want to be part of your supplier 
and your management and, and services. And you know, underneath, it's complicated. You know, we've all got our phones with our apps on and things like that, but underneath that, it is still a very complex set of things. And if you're producing a solution today, if you actually started, you know, by the time you actually develop something, just like that chart we saw earlier, the world will have passed you by. By the time you actually get to develop what you need, you can actually see that the, you know, two or three years time, as we said earlier, you know, some th things change. And just producing what you need is no longer enough. Because as we heard uh, from Jason, you actually now need to consider cyber security. You know, and by the way, yes, you also need to integrate things. You actually need to actually have mobility. You need to have apps. You need to have analytics. You need dashboards. Where did all that come from? You know, we didn't need all that before. But now, just to anything you're going to provide, we'll be expecting that sort of support. That's why you've got to collaborate. Take the bit that you know about and then bring in the rest of the technology to actually help you. And that's what's happening with controls manufacturers, with cafe home supply. Everybody's doing the same thing now, you know. Why would you want to generate a graphics package when you can bring one in? And I, people are beginning to use products slightly different. Here's a good example of um, a petrol station in the States called Wawa. And uh, they had a, a spec, much the same as anybody else was. They wanted energy analysis, remote servicing, better customer service, all those good things. And then once they were connected, they were actually able to provide... Oops, sorry were able to provide the fact that on top of their requirements, what they wanted to do, they were connected in, yeah, sure, to the HVAC, the energy, the lighting, life security, refrigeration, field, all those good things. Even the, the cooker, okay, that actually does the hot dogs was connected because when they changed hot dogs or suppliers, then they could get in and change the timing on the cooker. But where this really scored and where these guys are so much more innovative, they opened up their network and their access to their suppliers. So instead of a truck coming round every day or every other day or whenever it was with the fuel, they said, now you've got access. You can see exactly what fuel we've used, okay, and how much we need. So please don't come around every day. And by the, time, by the way, we want to do it just in time. We know how much we use and this is what the level should be. And they saved a fortune. Obviously, you can imagine on, on, on fuel inventory just on that, which paid for these systems time and time over. And this is done over about 800 stations, okay, so... Scale is, can be a large building or a small building. And then when you see things like data centers, their world is changing. You'd expect to see all the good things that we got up here with the multi-site management and drilling down, expect. But now they also want to do, because you're a co-location, you want to do tenant billing. So you want to charge by the rack or by, by you know, the, the usage. You also then want to start looking at the assets. And their world is changing too. They actually need to say, hey, we need to expand the building. Can we... Yeah, but let's do a what if. If we put something in, let's build a heat map so we can actually see what's going to happen if we put more racks in and where we should put them. And oh, by the way, you know, because it's busy in London at sort of 11 o'clock, it's not busy in Singapore or Shanghai or San Francisco. Why don't we move the load to there? But what effect will that have on theirs? So all these things are beginning to happen now where the connectivity is put in and using these sort of solutions. And I, um, Jason brought up where you actually got an IT network, all the, certainly all the larger projects we're seeing now. Um, there's an ICT network being separated out from the controls and uh, the rest of the management systems put in. And what it's beginning to do is associate people, okay, with, with the demands of the building. And I went to see someone the other day. We walked into his building. We swiped the card and he said, oh, yeah, fine, now I'll have... Uh, a full floor you know, seat by the window, that's great. And we go over there and it's powered up and it's got everything you need. And I went a, a week or so later to sit down with Cisco. I told them the story. They went, oh, yeah, we know all about that. Oh, well, why wouldn't I? I'd be able to actually know your... Uh, Roger's just stepped out the tube station. We know he's on his way. We know he likes a window row. So when he gets there on the board, it will actually say, just like we are saying earlier, up on the 11th floor, there you've got a seat. However... If there's a tube strike or some bad weather, don't send everybody up to the 11th floor. Keep them at the lower floors and save the energy and don't, don't bother with the rest. Hotels have been doing this for years. Because the hotels have been doing this where they actually just let half the hotel, depends on the occupation, integrate with their, their Fileto or micro software or whatever. That's being done and this is beginning to get shared across in buildings. 
and it's being extended. Um, we're now beginning to see the reality of smart buildings uh, coming along and IT as well as, uh, as telcos are getting involved. And all those things are things you'd be able to recognise. They're just now being spread across a much denser and wider application within cities. It brings in a lot more. Um, you can actually see here is the, is the applications where you've got the water management, you've got the wastage systems, you've got all the things you actually need across the city. Then you actually need the shared services because you do need to be able to actually provide people with support and all the dashboarding and the metrics and the, the analytics provided. And then you need the, infra the infrastructure, which is either going to come from the telcos or Wi-Fi or whatever. So these things are happening. And to give you a feel, um, we had a forum in uh, um, Dubai last year. We was lucky enough to have uh, Ismail um, Amazuki actually present, and he runs the FM. And they haven't even started this project. But they've got a project, okay, which is due to start because it's the 2020 Expo will be in Dubai. This site is now encompassing a new airport, which is going to be the biggest in the world, 200 gates. It's got a seaport, so you can actually go from sea to plane in four hours in a duty-free zone. Um, it will also host the 2020 uh, site for the expo. It will have a commercial area, it'll have a residential area. It'll have all sorts of stuff. This is twice the size of Hong Kong. Okay, they specified our, fortunately, they specified our stuff in, they put in their headquarters, and have already started work on how, you know, they're going to connect it all. So they bought an analytics package, because we've had a lot of talks about analytics today, but how, what do you do with it? What, what are you going to monitor and things? So they're, they're actually trialing it, they've got, they've got specialists in, they're actually looking at it, and we, we had this discussion about uh, analytics earlier. But if you take analytics, the big data is useless. It's actually worse than useless, you know, it's no good to you whatsoever unless you've got something to shrink that data because it's now impossible for you to look through. You can't do it on a spreadsheet. You can't look for what you're doing because it's too big. So what you've got to have to do is, is actually take something like an analytics package where you can use your expertise and say, this happens, that happens, and this happens, I want you to actually provide me with that data and take some action or give me, you know, allow me to make some better informed decisions. And when you're looking for an analytics package, I think it's important not just to look at that historian level, which is traditionally where we look at it. We need it real time, we need it at site level, we need it everywhere across the site. We need to be able to take action. So once something's happened, don't depend upon that piece of information being presented to someone. Why not take some action? You know, inform the chiller manufacturers, chillers are not working. Why not switch to the other chiller or load them differently or do whatever? That's important, you know, and also make sure you can gain access to the old history. You don't have to learn new tools and make sure it's fit for your, your uh, <coughs> industry rather than just general. I want to talk a little bit about disruption. <coughs> Excuse me. You've only got to ask these guys whether the world is disruptive or not um, from any perspective whenever you're looking at it. And Wireless will be disruptive. There's no question about it, but with what comes with it, it's quite interesting. And I have a, a kind of a pet hate, and I recently spoke at a hotel uh, management, and they, at the end of the, the, the talk, they said, what would you change in hotels? I said, okay, so here's, here's my time to actually lay off. So I said, I arrive at the hotel, I join the queue with five or six people, I eventually get to the, and they say, oh, Mr. Woodward, good evening, how are you? Would you like a newspaper? No, I wouldn't like a newspaper. Uh, breakfast is between 6.30 and 9.30, thank you, 6.30, and eventually you get your key and you go to your room. On the way out, I come and I now stand in a queue of 10 people because the printer's playing up, okay, or the girl is having a conversation with someone because they've got a problem with the bill. I eventually get to say, is everything okay? I say, yes, fine. Did you take anything from the mini bar? No, I didn't, did it? And so why isn't it? They knew when I arrived, okay? So they knew when I got off the plane, when I, when I drove into the car park, they knew me. I'm a member of the loyalty club, so they know my numbers. They've got my credit card details. Why do I have to go through that? We should be able to actually just go up to it. And when I'm leaving, you should just send me it, and I just push a button and say, yep, that's correct or not. Here's what the change is. So that has an effect. And as we actually look at that wireless technology and start looking at things, moving from you know, that key to this means that something happens that's going to be called dematerialization. 
because now if I'm just doing this, I actually don't need the key and therefore I don't need the distribution and logistics that actually provide it there. I don't need the factory that actually produced it. And of course, the, company, the, the factory that actually produced the raw materials in the first place, that can go. And I don't need the raw materials either. So suddenly I got down to a wireless solution. This will happen with wiring and all sorts of things. So you will actually find a change in the world from some of these technologies and we'll have to adapt to that. You've probably heard this one, but I'm going to go through it anyway, about the Dollar Shave Club in the States. So there was a company set up in the States called Dollar Shave, and you could actually, for a dollar, get five razor blades. Okay? And all you do is went online, ordered them, and you could adjust the, you know, the amount, how frequently they got delivered. They just got delivered in the post, and you'd, you'd actually pay for them and so on. And you could have, you know, upgrade, you could do whatever you like with it, but you, you, literally you just got them through the post. There was a five-year-old startup that actually took on Gillette and gained 8% of the US market. Well, pretty good, but what's different about this company? Well, they didn't have a factory. They just bought the blades from a, a company in Korea. They didn't have a distribution system. They just used you know, a local distribution company. Didn't have any R&D. That was done by the supplier. No sales force, no social media, no social, you know, no, and all their marketing is done through uh, YouTube and so on. And of course, they use Amazon Web Services, their platform. Okay, so they've just built a business from virtually nothing, which, by the way, you could do today with a control system because you could actually take something like Niagara, the best files, the best actuators, and suddenly you've got the best control solution in the world. So you can do this in many industries now, okay? And Gillette kind of lost the battle a little bit here because they focused on the product and not the customer. They kind of forgot men don't like to shop. Okay, so they were quite happy to go online and do this. Unilever paid a billion dollars last year for the Dollar Shave Club. Okay, so this is a company made out of nothing. So kind of interesting story. So think about that. I'm just wondering why you're all sat in here and not going on with something, get out there and start uh, picking up and starting a business from scratch with nothing. Um, you know, we're in a world where... You know, the big, we know these things where the biggest hotelier has no hotels, you know, the biggest taxi company has no taxi, and so on. You know, travel agent, the world's changing. The world's changing. And I, I love this one. This is from 2014, from RBS. Our busiest bank branch was the 701 train from Reading to Paddington, okay? 167,000 customers between 7 and 8 are actually using it. Okay, that's a change. That's a change. And I want to introduce something here which is, I think, will actually change the way we think about how we do business, particularly for you guys in the future. Um, we already said the products are smart and, and introduce a word here. God bless the Americans. They will always introduce new words and usually got a Z in it somewhere. So we got servitization. So what is that? It's kind of changing the mentality from instead of providing products, you actually start providing services. Okay, so you may start giving things away instead of actually selling them um, to actually supplement what you're doing. And there's a couple of interesting examples I'm going to give you how people have changed their businesses. The biggest disruptive change you can imagine has happened to lighting guys. Okay, when would you have thought that Philips, Osram, GE were all up for sale because they couldn't make any money out of lighting because there's 2,500 LED manufacturers in China just killed them. But what it did do is push them into the corner to be a bit more innovative. So Philips and GE and all these guys are working on this. They started looking saying, okay, so the LED is actually a piece of electronics, it's smart. <coughs> now I can connect to things, I can talk to things. So how about if I provide in a retail location, I can suddenly know, hey, Roger's just walked in the store. Oh, by the way, Roger, that pair of shoes that uh, your wife was looking at are on special offer on the first floor. And we just got some uh, cool jets in and, and so on. They got you just the way you are when you're on your PC at home and something comes up in the top right hand corner. They're going to actually offer this service to you on the phone as well. You can shop before you go, get there, they're walking around the store. This is happening. If you want to have a look on the internet, go to Carrefour in Lyon or there's uh, um, Walmart in uh, the US and so on. They're all doing this. And here's a, a, a lighting company's site, okay? So I thought I'd have a quick look to see what they're up to. So I'm looking here and I'm seeing indoor navigation, people tracking, space management, remote monitoring, advanced parking. Finally, 
I get to lighting. Okay, that's where these guys are starting to think. They're changing their world, and they got to go. They were forced, and I think a lot of other people will be too. But lighting is ubiquitous. Um, smart building systems are in about 25% of our buildings. Okay, I've got a I got a light bulb in my garden shed, and I truly believe that Li-Fi will be a reality. So we'll be connecting through because there's you can connect through in street lights. You can connect through, and you know there's repetition everywhere. So you've got a bad signal in here, well you might not if it's actually connecting through the lights. Here's another one. Ever seen these in a store? Why would people pay eight or nine dollars for a smart coding thing like this instead of a cent label or something that you can actually change? Well the reason is, if I suddenly said to you, well actually Coke, if you drink a can a day, will actually you know, cut down your chance of heart failure. Do not take my word on that, okay? But if I did, suddenly, because this is connected, they can dynamically change the pricing instantly off a thousand stores or whatever they want to do straight away. If things are not selling, they moderate. It gets paid for within, you know, the first day of that being put in because they can change by the demand. And think about that as your products in your buildings. Why wouldn't you be able to get product updates, remote diagnostics, energy efficiency, da da da, loaded on from the software? And here's one, Hilti, very smart guys, um, but probably a more of an expensive drill. So they're thinking, well, how can we change our business? I know. We'll provide the drill for free. So they go to the builders and they say, you can have the drill for nothing. Uh, okay, nothing? Yeah, yeah, you can have it for nothing. What's the catch in? How many do you need? Well, how are you going to charge us? Well, you only pay for when you use it. Why well, are you going to know when I use it? Well, it's got an RFID chip in that's actually connected through and we can tell you how much you're using it. And so you're only going to charge for when you use it. I can provide you with a health and safety report because you shouldn't be using it too long. I know you're always losing them. We can tell you where it is. You can gain access to it as well. Okay, but it's still for free, yeah. Anything else? Well, no, you do have to service the drill. Yeah, okay, fine, but you've got to come to Hilti for that. Well, we recognise we have to do that. It's okay. So we we'll, we'll do the service with you. Oh, by the way, those spares, the drills and the other bits and stuff. Yeah, now you've got to come to Hilti. Well, that, that's fine. Hilti never had that business at all previously. Now they've got a different model. They're getting paid with a kind of reoccurring revenue stream. They've got spares and service they never had before. And they look, you know, these opportunities in buildings, I firmly believe that you will be paying for cold water and hot water in the future. Okay, so the chiller manufacturer will give you the chiller for nothing and a boiler manufacturer the same. You can't buy a jet engine for a Rolls Royce anymore. They actually give it to them, they charge for how much you use it. Okay, but now it takes you longer to fly from London to New York because the information they fed back said don't fly at those speeds and if there's a problem with the wind, go this direction and so on because they're now able to provide you with knowledge back from what they're doing. And so there are other opportunities. Um, we've seen some of our customers like Bosch and Clima Veneta doing that. How easy is it to deploy? Well, we already said that products are getting smarter. You know, to connect it to the, to the web is dead simple. You've got a problem, come see me, we'll get you connected in 30 minutes. And then once you've got that, connect through to those that cloud services. Once you're connected, think about all those things you can offer. You know, just highlighting a couple there, staff efficiency, environmental compliance, minimise downtime, know before you go, know before your customer does. You know, fault analysis, all those good things you can do because you're now connected. Kind of reminds me of something again, which uh, uh, I think is where we're getting to with smart equipment. But it's, you know, it's not about the technology itself, it's only an enabler, has been said today. The key is what to do with the data. Um, this was from a previous, I won't, we've run out of time, but I think you know, it now gives you that bi-directional connection for the whole life cycle of the product. And it makes more sense to either lease or pay for what you get rather than paying up front because it moves from capex to opex. You know, any finance guy would tell you that's preferable. But for sure, you know, you've got direct customer contact through the whole you know, life cycle of the product, hopefully you get the renewal, and those service and spares probably about five times the value but at least you can manage it as well than the original sale. And don't forget these guys, because they're going to actually affect your business. It's an interesting difference between the fact that the older HR professionals with the grey hair, like me, I'm kind of blonde at the moment, but I'm eventually get there, 
but they think the, the younger guys are tech savvy. Whereas actually, the younger guys think, no, I'm not tech savvy, I'm a smart user. And there's big differences in the thinking, but when you actually have a look, you better start thinking about employing some of those Generate Next people. Look at those pink lines there. Generating revenue, adaptability, collaboration, problem solving, relationship building. You know, these are people you should be employing that's gonna help change your business too. So takeaways, um, I think products are getting smarter. They're connected. OT and IT convergence is happening. And servitization is definitely happening. I can promise you and gives you some sort of, gives you that, that competitive advantage. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a blueprint for the, for the IoT in buildings. Where are we? Well, we heard a lot today about the IoT. I still think we're on the hype curve. Uh, we're not there yet. You know, we're on our way. And uh, I think that's because, you know, it's more about the company than is the technology. But one thing's for sure, we always you know, overestimate what's going to happen in the next two years or underestimate what's going to happen in the next 10. So from our decision, we made a decision to actually take our software from edge to cloud so that we can provide those connected buildings and smart services and smart cities. A couple more slides here, just finally. Frost and Sullivan, IoT is again changing opportunity for smart building uh, uh, participants. The last five years have seen huge levels of technology innovation. The next five will be about business model innovation. You're going to have to change your business to actually take use of this. So my recommendation is, you know, grasp the technology. When? Well, probably now. You always have a choice, okay? Um, but maybe, just maybe, you know, that may actually be help you differentiate from everybody else. So the IoT and cloud services, how will you change your company? And let me just leave you with one final thought. So you know Uber and the story. Uh, probably you don't maybe know that Google are a big shareholder in, in uh, Uber. And they've got the self-drive car. One point, one three quarter million miles now. We have a few accidents. We, we're still in the UK. Don't know what it, all the shouting's about because Mr. Bean was doing this <laughs> years ago. But guess what? Uber actually already, uh, this is an old slide, but Uber already purchased self-driving taxis for their cars, okay, they ordered them. And other places are, Dubai ordering 200 self-driving Teslas and so on. So let me ask you a question. You know, when the driverless taxi arrives at your house, are you getting in? Thank you.